All right, we just have a couple more quadratic equations to solve, and we want to make sure that we go through that progression so we know the best way of solving these. So here I see I already have everything on one side of the equation, zeros on the other side. So let's look at our progression. The first thing we try to do, we try to use the square root property. Unfortunately, in order to use the square root property, we can only have one instance of x, but I see two x terms, so this is no good. The second thing we try to do is factoring. Well, this is 1, so we can look at the constant here and try to find factors of the constant that will add to 16. Uh, that's too large. It's never going to happen. Plus, it's prime. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're done here. This guy does not factor. The third thing that we try to do, we try to use the method of completing the square. Now remember that in order to complete the square, there are certain things that we want. We want this lead coefficient to be 1, it is, and we want this guy to be even, which means this is going to be the best and most efficient way for us to solve this quadratic equation. You could go to the next part and say, oh, I'm going to use the quadratic formula, which is going to end up with much larger numbers, and it's not going to be a lot of fun if you do that. So let's complete the square. We complete the square by leaving a gap and moving that constant term to the other side of the equation, like that. And with completing the square, we understand that we're supposed to put a number in this gap right here so that we have a polynomial that factors as a square. But here we, we know what it's going to be and we can kind of force the hand because what goes in here is half of that coefficient. So half of negative 16 is negative 8 and it's negative 8 squared, positive 64, that goes in that, in that gap. So when you look at the way the textbook, the textbook may do it, or my math lab, they're going to have you find this number first, and then factor it. These guys go together, they're so intertwined, that to me it's easier if I just go ahead and say half of this guy squared. So divide by 2 and square it. But remember, I'm adding 64 and I'm using a different color, right? So I can see what change I'm making. If I add 64 on the left, I have to add 64 on the right side as well. All right, so let's clean this up. On the right side, when I do the subtraction, I get negative 49. All right, and now we remember why we complete the square. We complete the square so that we can use the square root property. So let's take the square root of both sides. Remember, when we take the square root of both sides, the plus or minus must come into play immediately. So now, we have x minus 8 is equal to plus or minus, and the square root of 49 is 7. The negative here gives me the imaginary unit i. And then we're just one step away from having x completely by itself. So we add 8 to both sides. So x is equal to 8 plus or minus 7i. So again, we could have used the quadratic formula here. In fact, this problem is in that section about the quadratic formula. But the quadratic formula becomes really, really nasty because b is 16, and part of the quadratic formula is b squared, so you'd have to square 16 to get 256. You've got minus 4ac, which means minus 4 times 1 times 113, so that's, what, 452? Do you really want the large numbers? Probably not. So let's avoid the large numbers, and let's be efficient and recognize that completing the square is the best way to solve this. Now. I don't want to keep you from exploring and understanding other concepts, so if you want to try to solve this with the quadratic formula, go for it. But I also want you to know how to solve it by completing the square, because that is really the most efficient way of doing it. Let's take a look at this guy. Let's go through our progression. Can I use the square root property? In order to use the square root property, there can only be one instance of x, and that's the only place I see x, and it's contained inside of a square. So right away, this is perfect for the square root property. Awesome. So now we just have to start peeling away those layers. 
Remember that in order for us to use the square root property, we have to get the square by itself. Do not, do not try to expand this. Don't try to square this stuff out. That's bad. It creates more work, and more often than not, students don't square it correctly. So instead, move the 3 to the other side. Isolate that square. So we have 9x plus 4. Quantity squared is equal to 50. And now that we have the square by itself, this is where you get to use that square root property. So let's take the square root of both sides, remembering plus or minus. On the left side, this just gives me 9x plus 4. On the right side, we need to break down that 50, break down that radical. 50 breaks down as 25 times 2. Each factor is its own little square root. Can you take the square root of 2? Not very nicely. But you can take the square root of 25, and that's just 5. So this becomes plus or minus 5 times the square root of 2. Right? Remember the plus or minus goes in front of whatever you simplify out of this. So it's not 5 plus or minus the square root of 2, it's plus or minus 5 times the square root of 2. And then we just take our little steps to finish getting x by itself. So 9x is equal to negative 4 plus or minus 5 square roots of 2. And the final step for isolating x is to divide by its coefficient. So x is equal to negative 4 plus or minus 5 square roots of 2 all over 9. Uh, you could try to separate this, but if you've got negative 4 plus 5 square roots of 2, those guys can't combine, so there's no point in doing 1 plus and 1 minus. The same thing is true with the last example. If I have 8 plus the square root, uh, 8 plus 7i, you can't do anything else with that because they're not like terms. And so this is all that we have. Hope that makes sense. See you for the next section.